I'm going to be your MC. Uh, my name is Nathan Mantaneke. I am originally from Bilbao, northern Spain. So I'm a Basque, which is kind of like being uh, a Scottish person from, if you were from the United Kingdom. Uh, so I, I love Spain. I've been living in the UK for many years and then back uh, in the sun, enjoying life in Malaga. Great people and great place. And uh, I'm a business coach, so I help people with their businesses. Uh, but we're here today to discuss how to make the best of living in the sun. Uh, we live in a part of Spain but that is quite popular nowadays, Costa del Sol, for holiday makers, for people that want to have the second home. Um, because of, it's got a very long coastline and it's got great opportunities to satisfy virtually any preferences that people may have. If you want golf, you have it. If you want snow, you have it, believe it or not, because we've got Sierra Nevada next to this area. You've got great features uh, in here. Uh, so depending on, on your budget, depending on your family situation, may, different areas of Spain or Costa del Sol could be advisable to cover your needs uh, and wishes. If you want more action, if you want peace and quiet, if you want elegant and luxury, if you want a bit of exclusivity, uh, you can find different areas. Uh, so BTB Club, which is uh, this logo that you find uh, in here, uh, represents this webinar. We are a business networking group in Malaga, in Costa del Sol. We have a group in Malaga and another one also uh, in Mabea. So what we're doing, we have these five very experienced professionals in the most relevant areas when you have to thinking of getting a second home or maybe why not uh, permanently living as a resident in Spain. So let me speak first of all about a personal friend that I, whose uh, relationship I treasure because him as a person, but also because of expertise. Uh, Antonio Doblas is a lawyer with more than 25 years of experience. So he's seen it all in, in Malaga and in law probably, uh, very, very seasoned and he specializes in different areas like real estate. Uh, and he can help you with any legal procedures that you may need from the moment you start thinking of buying a property uh, or maybe buying and selling a house. And um, it's very interesting uh, the way he works. He's a very experienced networker as well. Uh, from the moment you, you need to go to the notary or you need to get your title deeds in the land registry, all those things he can help you. Uh, to sort out from the legal perspective. And then uh, we've got Karina Yulander, a very experienced real estate agent at the agency Comprar Casa Hernán Bustos. And she's an expert in the property market. She has lived many, many years in the Costa del Sol, and she works with both buying and selling clients. Her motto is always walk the extra mile for, for her clients, that's what she does. And we've got a few clients of her uh, on this call as well, like Stefan, for example. Uh, he, he's gonna tell, uh, tell us a little bit more about his experience with Karina, I have no doubt about that. And then uh, another personal friend, Jonathan Holdaway, one of the first chartered financial planners in the United Kingdom and a permanent resident in Spain. Jonathan is also a certified life planner who has the experience, he has the tools to give you a hand with all your financial goals. Uh, as an ex-professional rugby player and an ex-military as well, he has a very strong sense of integrity, sportsmanship, uh, and, and a very strong dedication to service to his clients. And uh, it's very beautiful to see how he's been able to help different generations in the same families uh, back home in the UK and in other places. So he has held uh, the grandfather and then the children and then the grandchildren with how to, uh, what to, how to accomplish their financial goals. So very nice professional. And what can I say about Rocío Luna? We've been working for a few years as well. Uh, she's worked as an international tax advisor and is well uh, known, uh, uh, this firm, in the law firms, for more than 23 years. In fact, you've been working for some of the big four uh, in there, so you bring all that expertise 
into your work. You are currently part of Idea Assessores and a member of the global firm Russell Bedford, that is in more than 100 countries. So this uh, international network of auditors and tax advisors uh, that is present in all these countries in the world. And But I would focus not just in, in, you, in your expertise, Rocio, but also uh, I like the way you define yourself. Your main characteristic is your personal attachment and involvement, how engaged you are in the search for solutions for your client. So you don't limit yourself to that area. Taxes, for example, you will go, you will straight and look for anything else that they need to, to accomplish, uh, that they have a, a good service. Ruthie is Spanish, is from Malaga. She's always lived in Malaga as well, along with her husband and three children. And family for her comes, comes first. Uh, great, great professional uh, in there. And also, allow me to talk about one of the founding members as well, uh, alongside with Jonathan, of BTB Club, Stefan Haynes. This uh, handsome, soon, to, soon 50 years old to be, uh, he's from Sweden. He's been living already in Spain for some four years already with the, your wife and your two teenager uh, sons. He spent most of his career in telecommunications and software business. Uh, and that has taken you to many countries in the world. You lived in, in Greece, you live in, in all over the, the place, really. So Spain has, has been a, another step in there. You, you, ste you lived for two years in Barcelona when you were running an e M EMEA, I think is the name, a partner sales organization. And over the last 10 years, you've been heavily involved with corporate social responsibility, with projects that have to do with charity, volunteering, this volunteer uh, work. I know you work in, in a project also in, in uh, Eastern Africa. Uh, so very inspiring entrepreneur. Uh, the thing is you lived in Spain, but you chose to leave Malaga and that safe, um, safe employment that you have when you started with the sustainability business and you moved to Mijas uh, in the Costa del Sol two years ago. So we, we're gonna look forward to learn from you. And with this, this is, uh, I would suggest for you to bring pen and paper if you can, if you are from the X generation and previous generations. Uh, and if you are younger, maybe you might want to have your iPads or your devices to make any notes. And we're gonna, going to invite you to feel free to comment on the chat any questions you have, please, by all means, make a note or post them on the chat because at the very end of the webinar, which is, we promise is not going to be more than 27 minutes uh, of webinar, then you, you're you welcome to ask your questions and our experts will, will try to do the best to add value to you and answer those questions. And with this, I'm going to hand over to uh, Stefan because we, we start in the webinar. Yeah, so every family have their own circumstances around and they are, everyone is of course different. So my story reaches over six years and it contains the most common questions I would say where you come to think about when you're going to move abroad or in this case Spain. So up until 2014 I would say we were a very average family of four people in Stockholm, Sweden. We went for vacation, uh, vacation here at the Costa del Sol and we got the urge to have a place here we call the second home. So before we go into all the details here on the full story, we, we started, off, uh, started off with a second home here in Costa del Sol. Then I got a job in Barcelona. So we left Stockholm and rented a house for two years. And then we sold this house that we just bought and then buy a permanent one of which we now live in. So we've gone through most of these different steps and you know, you may have one or two of them, but that's what we're going to talk to, uh, to you about today. Yeah. So where to begin? We started with the budget and location. But you can start in any angle you want, of course. So what can we afford and where? Uh, that's required a lot of research. So we just stopped in the windows in every real estate agent we found. And we picked up some newspapers and, you know, get the picture of what it's like. Then we came back afterwards, our holiday, we went back to Sweden, of course. 
And we took a deeper dive into internet and found all the general uh, websites like Idealista, Fotocasa, but also the individual real estate companies. So what we did, we reached out to a few of these real estate agents. And one of them is Karina, who's also a member of the B2B club. So Karina, can you help us to understand what you do when people come to you with questions regarding houses? Thank you, Stefan. Yes. When I first get in touch with a client who wants to buy a property here at Casa del Sol, I like to get to know the person, either by meeting in person, by a phone call, or an online meeting is also a good option. We will go through all the needs and wishes of the client, and I will orient myself about the necessary details, such as criteria, location, if there's a need for a mortgage, how the property will be used, and so on. That way, I will get essential knowledge to start working. I will, of course, also inform them about all the details included in the process of purchasing a property, give information about the areas and nice-to-know things. I believe it's necessary to walk the extra mile for the client and give the best possible customer satisfaction. The help of an estate agent is really recommended because you will benefit from expertise to mute or... and avoid mistakes. You're, you're absolutely right. We couldn't have done this without you. Thank you. So my next obvious question is about the administration here in Spain and regarding the buying a property here and the laws regarding that. So I needed to, to hire a lawyer. So Antonio, can you please help us to explain what happens when you're going to buy a property here in Spain? Yes, of course. Thank you, Mr. Stefan. Well, first of all, uh, the lawyer will investigate uh, that everything is in order legally. Uh, this takes, uh, this procedure takes normally uh, two weeks and then the lawyer, lawyer like me, give you the authorization uh, to pay a reservation fee. That, uh, that would be amount, uh, an amount about uh, 6,000 euros to take the property off the market. Signing at the same time uh, what we call a reservation contract. In this sense, the lawyer, a lawyer like me, uh, will check the documents of the property to assure the legality of the estate. That means the previous title deeds uh, has to be in the land registry, the property has no charges, no encumbrances, no mortgages, the property is free of tenants, um, there is no sanctioning procedure against the building in the town hall or in, this, in, in, in every case. Then the lawyer will prepare the private purchase contract that has to be signed along with the seller. Afterwards, the lawyer, uh, in, in, meanwhile, that means uh, in a period of time that could be two months, after that two months, the lawyer will prepare the title deeds, we call in Spanish escritura, that has to be signed in front of the notary. And uh, the, the lawyer will go with you the date of the completion to sign uh, this document, this public document. Finally, the, doc the, the lawyer will handle all the formalities uh, regarding with this public title leads, paying taxes up to the title leads is in the land registry, and at the end of the whole, the, the, the whole procedure, he will give you the master copy of the title leads, the master copy of the invoices, and the final settlement of the money you paid for the cost, for the taxes, for the fees, and so on. Thank you. Very informative, Antonio. Yes, so that's regarding the legal issues uh, buying a property. So next question is, of course, concerning tax and how, how much is that? And Rothio, could you possibly help us to understand how much is the tax regarding purchasing a property here in Spain? I will try. Thank you. There are different costs when you buy a uh, property in Spain. When you buy a uh, used property, you pay the transfer tax, which the tax rate on property is up to 400,000 euros, and the tax rate is 8% here in Andalusia. But in the case of new 
build properties, the tax rate is 10%. There is also notary and register fees. The notary fee is about 0.5 up to 1% of the purchase price, and so is the, the registration cost. Sorry. In total, the purchase costs amount to 10% approximately of the purchase price and 12% if it is a new build property. In a second step, once you become the owner of the summer house, the Spanish tax authorities also impose a standard tax, tax that is levied because it is assumed that the owner rents out but doesn't declare his income. Now you can see on the screen the following slide with a calculation, with an estimation. The tax is calculated at 1.1% of the tax value and then 24%. 19% for EU citizens. The, that, that this tax rate, 24%, is taking on this amount. You would not have to pay this tax in case you rent your summer house instead of acquiring the property. Also, when, uh, when you become a tax resident, you would not have to pay this tax either because your house would be considered as permanent resident in Spain. Now you can see another slide on your screen where it is shown the different taxes and circumstances that we have commented. Thank you, Rocio. That was very insightful. Thank you. So, now you need to pay for your house as well. So, the obvious question is mortgage. And how do you get your mortgage done here in Spain? You don't think can you can help us with that? Certainly. First of all, you need to get an NIE number and you need this to do virtually anything in Spain and you'll need to provide a passport and proof of address in order to get this. It might be an idea to also open a bank account, although be warned, you will have to also open a bank account with the mortgage company that you end up getting your loan with. So you might end up with two accounts. Um, you have to put the funds for the uh, purchase of the property, any deposit, any fees into your bank account. You can apply for your mortgage either here in Spain or in your home country before you leave. So I would advise using a broker to get the best deal possible for you. And there are some brokers that are set up specifically to, to give international mortgages. But what I did was I applied in Spain. I found it a lot easier. As with any mortgage, they will check your financial situation and they will ask for information about your income. They could also be asked for a tax return, pay slips, and if you have any other loans in your home country, they will ask for information on that. Then, when you have found a property and you've done all the checks, as we've discussed, they will need a survey being done or evaluation. So, this would normally be done by a valuer um, appointed by the lender, and it will be around about four to five hundred euros, depending on the size of the property. And it is the valuation, not the price you're paying for the property, and this is very important, that forms the basis for the amount of mortgage that they will give you. As a foreigner, you can borrow 70%, which is calculated on the lowest value, either the valuation or the purchase price. It's very important. So you must either negotiate the, the purchase price or agree some sort of cash difference with the with the seller. Remember you need 30% deposit to put down on the property and also in addition to the costs that Rocio and the taxes that Rocio has mentioned already. So around about 40% minimum for the whole purchase. So if you were to buy an apartment for say 150,000 euros, it will cost you around 60,000 in total, including the deposit and the taxes and the, the notary and lawyer fees. The process for getting your loan approved in Spain takes around six weeks, depending on how quickly they can do the valuation. And interest rates at the moment are very competitive at around about 2%. Thank you, Jonathan. Very good information. Thank you. So we have sales price, we have mortgage, we have tax, and we also have different other costs considering uh, purchasing a house and having a house. So Karina, can you please run us through what, what are the other costs to, con to be considered? Yes, I can. 
There are mainly three different running costs to take into consideration. And uh, that is the community fee. Uh, in Spain, it's called the uh, comunidad. And that is a fee that all the owners pay for facilities in the, uh, in the community. So uh, a quite normal sum is uh, from 100 to 250 euros a month. And that covers uh, if there's a pool or a garden and cleaning of the stairs or uh, operating costs like, like that. So it's also calculated on the size of the property. So the more facilities and the bigger your property, the, the, this uh, community fee comes up a bit. Then we have the municipality tax, which is paid once a year. It's called uh, EB or IBI. And uh, that also is calculated on the size of the property and so on. It's usually around 1% of the uh, assessed value of the property. And finally, the third one is garbage or, or trash collection, uh, which is normally around 100 uh, euros a, a, a year. So that would be the extra costs, okay. the running costs. Thank you for that. Perfect. So, me and my family, we left Sweden. We are now tax residents of Spain, uh, but we still have some savings and some pension left in my home country. So, now we're considering what to do with that savings and pension. Jonathan, maybe you can walk us through some of the solutions here. Sure, of course I can. Um, well, the first thing to, to remember is to have an emergency fund in a readily accessible bank account. And around about three to six months uh, income is a good um, mark to have. Um, but the problem with that is that the interest rates are very low in banks. As we've already said, the mortgage rates are low, so the interest rates you get on your savings are going to be low as well. So when you've got your emergency fund and you're going to invest some money for the longer term, it can be invested in a much more effective way. This could be through what we call a Spanish tax compliant investment bond that would have to meet certain requirements. Funds that you invest in must be qualifying what we call USITs, and these can be fixed interest or corporate bond funds, properties or worldwide equity funds. All of these would be liquid and therefore readily accessible, but they are medium to long-term investments. How much to invest in each fund or funds would depend on your time scale of your investment and your attitude to risk which would need to be assessed. The other important thing to consider is that the tax-free investment that you have in your home country, such as in the UK, uh, we have uh, what we call an individual savings account, or ISA, they will, they will not be tax-free in Spain once you are a tax resident here. The Spain treats tax-free investments such as ISAs very differently. And if you're Class as tax resident in Spain after 183 days of living in the country and you have more than 50,000 euros in an overseas investment in your home country, then this needs to be declared in a Modelo 720 tax return. And there are some very, very big fines for not doing this. Then any gains or income from the investment could be subject to taxes depending on the amounts and the allowances given by your particular autonomous community for example, Andalusia, where we are now. As an alternative, you could actually move your money into a Spanish tax compliant bond, as we've already mentioned, and this would be a much more tax efficient way of investing for growth or income if you're a tax resident in Spain. Here's a slide that explains that in more detail. The other thing to consider is your employer's pension scheme or personal pension that you have in your home country. Now, by all means, you have to consider your options for leaving it there or bringing it into another jurisdiction. Depending on the amount you have, a QOPS, which is a qualifying recognised overseas pension scheme, could be more attractive when it comes to drawing the money out. Especially if you are a UK resident now and you are near or over the lifetime allowance. 
you might be better off moving your funds to an international self-invested personal pension, or SIP, which has a wider investment choice and multiple currencies, which, be, which again can be very useful when drawing your benefits. If you have a defined benefit scheme, because they are linked to your final salary and the service in the company, they need specialist analysis, which I can arrange with a specialist person. Either way, it is best to explore your options so you can make a decision from an informed position. Again, as with any financial advice, it is important to seek from a qualified, experienced professional who is regulated in this, these areas to give you the correct advice. Oh, all right, great. Thank you so much for that, Jonathan. So, some of you may add end up in the same position as me, that meaning selling a house in Spain. So we had a summer house that we sold uh, a couple of years ago. And that, of course, has some implications on all different things. So, Rothio, can you help us to understand what happens when you sell a house? Yes, of course. The sale of a house pays taxes even if you are not tax resident in Spain. The taxes you pay in connection with a sale of property are mainly two different ones. The first one, plus valia in Spanish, in Spanish, plus valia tax, which is calculated on the increase of value of the land which the property is built on, and it is paid to the city council of the municipality in which the house is located. It doesn't matter if you are a tax resident or not for this tax. It is compulsory in both cases. And the second step, capital gain tax, uh, the second tax I mean. Uh, in case you make a gain, of course. Uh, for non-resident, the percentage is 24%, again, 19% for EU citizens. From this amount, the withholding made by the purchaser of the property at the time of sale will be deducted. The acquiry of a real estate sold by a non-resident is required to make a 3% withholding on the sale price. If the seller is, if the seller, sorry, is a tax resident, the percentage ranges from 19 to 23 percent, and there is no withholding at the time of the sale. Thank you for that, Lucio. And Antonia, what's the legal aspect of selling a house? Well, uh, honestly, this procedure is much easier than buying a property because it's supposed to be that your your, your property is legal 100 percent. But I would recommend you to hire a lawyer like me, uh, especially for the preliminary uh, agreement or contract, uh, and to, pre to prepare it or to check the document that has been prepared by the other lawyer involved in this, in this matter. And of course, to, to go with you uh, to the notary to sign the, the date of the completion, to sign the title deeds in front of the notary, uh, to check the documents, to check the title deeds, the, the scriptura, uh, and to, to finish with all the, this procedure. And so, okay, great, thank you. So, you can also uh, rent the house, of course. Many people who decide to move down here, they start with renting. And in my case, we rented a house in Barcelona for two years when I was working there. So, what is the legal implication of renting a house, Antonio? Oh, okay, well, first of all, uh, you need to know your own needs uh, because it's not the same to rent for long terms or short terms. Short terms will be more expensive and long terms will be cheaper, but you need to know several things. If you are renting what is going to be your home, then you will have the right to live there for a minimum of five years. Only you want. You, but you will have to pay a deposit, uh, what we call in Spanish fianza, equivalent to one month of the rent that the owner will give, up, will give it back to you when the contract is finished, only if you give the home back in the same conditions you receive it, with no damage and once paid all the utility bills. And the last thing and the most important thing is if, if you have to live in that home for a period of six months minimum, otherwise, the owner can put a clause or requirement in the contract claiming a compensation, a monetary compensation, uh, not to fill the whole time of the, of the contract. 
And that's all. Yeah. Thank you, Antonio. That was great. So now you may uh, think about what are you going to do when you come to Spain? Either you have an employment or you do like me. That meaning leaving that employment and starting a company. So last year I left my employment in Barcelona and decided to open up a new Spanish limited uh, company here in Spain. So my wife and I, we run a AFEC team as we call this company now that works with information, lectures and marketing about green in uh, sustainable investments. So we teach and preach the meaning of voting with your dollar and uh, what impact that has. But to run a company, we need to start the company, and we talked to Rocío about that. So can you tell us a bit more about how to do that? Yes, of course. You can run a new business in Spain as a self-employer or by setting up a new company. In both cases, the VAT and withholdings must be declared quarterly. But business profits pay different taxes. In the case of being a self-employer, the benefits are declared in the individual income tax, called, as I said before previously, IRPF in Spanish, with a tax rate that could reach close to 50%. And, you have, and if you have a company, the, the benefits are declared in the corporation income tax with a flat rate of 25%, even 15% the first two years. However, Companies imply greater maintenance obligations such as accounting and accounts, etc. In my opinion, for annual profits above uh, 100,000 euros, it is always more advantageous to develop the business with a company than to do it as a freelancer. And for benefits of less than 100,000 euros, each case should be separately analyzed before making a decision since there are more consider considerations to take into account, such as the limitation of liability, because the self-employed people are responsible for the business with all their personal assets. And in addition, you, you were wondering about uh, employee uh, taxes for employees. Well, if your revenues come from employment, uh, unemployment in Spain, of course, you must pay the individual income tax, again, IRPF in Spanish, if you are a tax resident, or the non-resident resident income tax if you aren't. In the first case, the tax rate is a progressive one and could rise up to 45% for more than 120,000 euros, net incomes. But in the second case, the tax rate is a fixed one, the 24%, again, 19% for EU citizens. Oh, man. Thank you for that. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you. This is it. And I uh, hope my story, together with all these professionals' answers here, uh, have given you some good insights on how to proceed with your dream and live and move over to Spain. So thank you very much for the preparation of the webinar and all the information that you've shared with us. Now this is the time when you can ask your questions. So feel free to write on the chat any questions you may have. Thank you very much to Patricia with, I have to say, from regional events. She organizes events uh, from all the countries in Spain uh, for companies for being in the, you know, in the sound control and also doing as attendant. So thank you very much, Patricia, for that. Uh, but let me share with you these uh, colleagues that have put together this webinar uh, from BTB Club Business Networking have done this to add as much value as possible and help you if you're considering to move to Spain or you are already moved to Spain. But there is a, a group of uh, plenty of other business owners who can help also with other aspects of the process. For example, we've got Lina Grubler from Germany, who is also a resident in Costa del Sol that would do interior design. We would have people, uh, great professionals, that, who would coach you and teach your family or your business, in, even team, uh, how to speak Spanish and how to be more integrated. 
and, and plenty more services in there. Uh, with this, we would like to open uh, the question and answer. I know we have a very positive comment from Suzanne that shares something in there. She's quite pleased with the apartment that you sold her in Los Pacos. So congratulations, that's great feedback. It's not a question, but it's always nice to have. Uh, we've got a question from Goran. So Karina, how do you see prices of property develop next two to four years, considering the situation with COVID? And are new construction projects being on hold at the minute? So, sorry, we're gonna unmute you now. So if you can unmute yourself, Whenever you're ready. There you yes. go. Hi. Thank you for for the question. Yes. Uh, the the question about the property market and how what's going to happen to the prices if they are going up or down uh, is something that lots of people is wondering about. And uh, all sources are talking about that we actually don't have a financial financial crisis now. Instead, we have a mobility crisis. People cannot move freely uh, because of the COVID-19, and that, of course, has affected the, the prices to, to uh, um, stop uh, rising and, in some cases, drop down, of course. Uh, everybody believes that uh, the market will uh, pick up and return to the post or the uh, before the before COVID situation at the end of uh, uh, 2021. So in a little bit more than a year, we will be about in the same situation as we were before COVID. And uh, further on, if well, nobody has a crystal ball, of course, but but um, if uh, nothing extraordinary happens, the prices will rise, certainly, certainly. We can compare this Costa del Sol to the coast of Costa del Sol to the French Riviera, where the prices are super high and like 30, 40 years ago, it was possible to buy something quite affordable there, not any yeah. longer. And uh, this coast of Spain is coming right after. People want to be by the sea. Uh, so my estimation is that after uh, a year, more or less, the prices will certainly rise. Fantastic. Regarding the new promotion, there was a question about new promotion as well. Yep. Uh, some of them are struggling, of course, and uh, some of them are maybe slowing down or um, um, projects that haven't started already, they will, of course, wait a bit to, to start constructing. But the ones that, the larger one that's underway, way underway, they are continuing as planned. Excellent. Thank you very much for sharing that. Can I add something? Uh, can I add something to the discussion? Yeah. I just uh, think it's interesting how I'm hearing a lot that people are looking for uh, sort of more countryside homes because of the COVID. So the COVID has had a change people's views on property a bit, have a bit more space, a bit more uh, quieter maybe. So that um, particularly in, in your uh, Guam, uh, they ran out of uh, country villas uh, apparently in that area to actually show people because the demand was so, so I think it, it does depend on what properties you're looking at. Absolutely. It will have an impact there. Also, the type of property. Uh, we got another question. I think oh, it was for uh, for I, I, I would like to comment one thing. Um, definitely, uh, I think that in this situation, uh, as in the whole, in in every crisis, uh, theoretical crisis, uh, I think if the people are thinking in in buying a property in Spain, in making an investment. 
I think is the best option, the best, the best time, because you can get a lot of opportunities, you can get, get a lot of uh, possibilities to buy in an affordable uh, prices because, uh, well, honestly, the prices are, well, are, are stopping are, and you can find a lot of opportunities, a lot of plots, a lot of uh, apartments, a lot of big houses, as Jonathan has told us, uh, in a very, very good prices at this time. And I think during this, during this year, the rest of the year, and the, at the beginning of this coming year, people who want to buy in property in Spain uh, will find a lot of opportunities to buy at very, very good prices in a very good locations um, with the very good opportunities of investment. That's all. Can I add something to what Antonio just said and, and uh, the question I got? Yes, and we also see that there are kind of hidden discounts. So property owners may not want to uh, advertise a drop in price uh, so much, maybe a little bit, but not so much. But when you get into a negotiation, if you make an offer and so, you may be aware that they are willing to drop the price quite a lot. So, so it's a very good time to buy now until um, within six months would be the very best time to buy for sure. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, before I ask the second question, any other thoughts? Because I don't want to, to count you there. Excellent. So let's move on to the next question. I think this is about um, business uh, and taxes. So for Rocio, uh, mm -hmm. and it's from Hamza Alavirat. And he asks, as a German company, if I am going to sell physical goods and services to the Spanish end customers, must I register a branch in Spain? Okay. It depends on the amount of the sales and it depends on the uh, consideration of the operation, but in a general idea, you don't need to, to get a branch. You just have to ask for a, a tax identification number for VAT purposes, especially if the operation is located in Spain for VAT purposes. So depending on the operation, we I would have to analyze if it's subject to Spanish VAT, so you would need ask for a, a tax identification number before the tra Spanish tax authorities and file the VAT tax return every quarter or every month. But that's all. Mm, you don't need a branch mm, compulsory. It depends on the amount, okay? But uh, well, you can get my contact details and we can talk about it by, uh, via email. Excellent. Thank you very much. We've got a question for Antonio, um, Mathis Legal. So what happens if you are not in Spain when you have to sign in front of the notary? What what happens with those um, bureaucracy that you have to, to do? Well, uh, there is a very common situation, uh, especially in these times nowadays because of the COVID situation. That means you, you have signed, for example, a private document and you, you have a, a fixed date of the completion of the, of the, for signing in front of the notary, the right. title deeds. At that point, my recommendation would be to sign a power of attorney. This is a, a, a public title, a power, uh, so your lawyer can sign the documents or the private document or in the, majority of the cases, the, the public title leads in your behalf. Uh, we, are, uh, we have a lot of experience preparing this power of attorney. If you are not in Spain, don't worry about that. We can prepare or in the Spanish consulate or the Spanish embassy, or for example, if you are in the UK, uh, in the UK, I, uh, there are a lot of uh, notaries, public notaries, uh, very with a lot of experience preparing these kind of documents, we used to send the the, the well the the, the content uh, or with the, all the faculties uh, they have to put in the in the public document. Uh, you sign in your country, and you send first first of all by fax or well by email in this case, 
but later you have to send the, the master copy, the original by a courier, for example, DHL or FedEx. And, and we, uh, um, of course, with that document, we can sign in front of the notary, pay the rest of the money, and, and, and finish the, the whole the whole thing. It's very okay. don't, don't worry about that. Thank you very much. We've got also another a question from. Um, bear me a second. I'm nearly there. From Annette Maria Nord. And she says, many countryside properties, I believe it's going to be for Karina, very likely, many countryside properties do not have an AFO that is needed for renovations and rebuilding, uh, obra mayor or obra menor. How do you manage proper, property renovations? Because many are also placed in protected areas. I'm sorry, but I think that question is better for Antonio. Okay, uh, let, let me share with you while Antonio has a look at, at the question. Uh, we do have many contacts with architects, which would be naturally the ones in Spain that would uh, apply for any sort of license. So when you are going to carry out any type of work, the architect is, is in a unique position to know what the town hall of that municipality will require for your property. And that person will, will be able to check that. But maybe Antonio can, can bring some more light what is needed on, on different areas of Spain when you have to carry out any renovations or any obra mayor that, that, that uh, Annette is asking. We have, we have to make a distinguish between urban properties or rustic properties. For example, if you are buying a urban property, you don't, you don't need to worry about any of these matters because an urban property in theory, they have to have 100% of the, of the documents absolutely legal. Don't worry in this case. But to be honest with you, if you are buying a rustic property, then you need always 100% a lawyer, and perhaps as Nathan has told us, an architect to check, first of all, uh, to, to make a survey, to make a survey of the, of the futures, of the characteristics of, of, the, of the building, uh, especially if, it's, if the building is in the middle of the countryside, uh, to check, to check the, the property. Uh, the lawyer will check the, the documents, but honestly, it's very common that uh, in these cases, uh, the, the documents are not 100% legal. Then, it depends on the agreement. It depends on the agreement. My recommendation would be, if you are buying a rustic property, you have to uh, ask for the vendor to legalize 100% of the property. It's not your fault if the property are not legal 100%. My recommendation would be, okay, all the documents have to be prepared by the vendor, have to be paid by the vendor, and you have to buy a property 100% legal. Your lawyer will help you in this matter, will push you, the vendor or the lawyer of the vendor, to handle the formalities to legalize these uh, buildings, these the viewings. And uh, if you are uh, with a good lawyer, an uh, experienced lawyer in this matter, uh, they, don't, they don't allow you to sign any document if the documents are not right. Excellent. And I would suggest uh, you don't want to buy a property in Spain without going first with a lawyer, uh, because you probably heard in the news about these really bad experiences of expats buying properties and then having something wrong with either the, the land or reg regulations apply applicable to, to that particular plot. And so that's where my comment will be because that's what exactly okay. what I did. <laughs> so I managed to negotiate the price down quite significant and took on the burden to go through the whole legalization and authorization of the whole land and everything. And we are just now, after two years into this, in the last stage of this so if there are issues with legalizing of the of the land uh, you need to have a lawyer that you can speak to um we are going to fix it in the end but we're going to pay for it but we got the discount to pay for that so we were we did it on purpose we knew about this but um 
if you're not prepared for it, it's going to be tough. That's a great point as well, because you can use that to negotiate. And we got a couple of questions. I think they might be super suited for Jonathan. So uh, you mentioned, Jonathan, about uh, life planning. What, what is that exactly? And the second question, uh, because uh, we've heard some bad things about financial advisory in Spain, how, how are you any different? What, what can you bring uh, and what what is the benefit from from uh, contacting you? Well, that's, that's a great question. Uh, well, both great questions, actually. Uh, if I can take the first one, um, well, a life planner really works um, in a different way to a financial planner, although there are financial aspects to somebody's life, obviously. But we take a, a deep, a long look at uh, your current situation, your life got at the moment, your your dreams, your goals, your your ambitions for the future. As five, 10, 15, 20 years, or 25, you know, till you die. And we basically, we sort of uh, make, you know, help you make that life, live into that life, basically. So, you know, part of that, as I said, financial, but part of it is having a mindset about what you're doing with your life. And then that's where I come in as a life plan to, to bring the two aspects together. Um, so that's hopefully the, the first one. Um, the second one is, well, it's a, it's a subject that's close to my heart, actually. I, I, I don't like to hear about people being ripped off. Um, and basically, uh, I sort of came to Spain on a bit of a crusade uh, to sort of, um, you know, bring a new sort of fresh UK style uh, financial planning um, model to, to Spain, because I, I feel that too much has gone uh, bad for people who've taken financial advice in Spain before. Um, certainly there's not as much regulation here as there is in the UK. So um, you know, companies can get away with far more in terms of charges. Uh, in the UK, you know, they, they would be uh, you know, sort of uh, severely sort of um, reprimanded for the sort of, sort of things that go on here. So for example, you know, if you've got some funds in your, um, investments those funds uh, sometimes pay commissions to the to the brokers and they're hidden commissions so you don't even know about them but it's coming out of your money at the end of the day that it's invested so yes it's good to uh, ask this question and yes the the industry hasn't exactly uh, you know done very well in the last few years but the things are changing and MIFID the um the markets and financial instruments directed from the, U the EU is helping uh, drive some of that change in, in regulation and change in uh, what financial advisors have to tell the clients before they part with a penny. So, you know, that's all good. But um, so I don't want to be too down on the, the sector, but, you know, it, it is full of horror stories. So I think the thing is we move on from the past. We've got a new financial planning model, if you like, uh, available. Uh, if you want it, then come and speak, speak to me or have a look at my website. Thank you very much. That's a very um, good answer, I think, very illustrative there. And also we got another one having to do with taxes. When do you become a tax resident in Spain? And what does that mean exactly? That, that obviously for Rothio. Uh, we need to unmute you. There you go. I'm uh, sorry, we, you are not unmuted. You have to click and unmute yourself. Can you hear me now? Loud and clear. Okay. There are three different ways to become a tax resident in Spain. The 183-day rules, which has been mentioned uh, previously, which consists of staying more than 183 days in Spain, in Spain during the calendar year, easy. The second one, which is the Center of Economic Interest Rule, which consists of having in Spain the main base of your activities or economic interests. And the last one, the third way to become in a tax resident in Spain is uh, the center of vital interest truth, which consists of having your wife or husband and children residing in Spain. That's more or less a general idea about how to become in a resident in Spain. But the easiest one is the first, the 183-day rule. Excellent. Thank you very much. We've got a double question for Antonio, I think. Uh, so the first one is, 
what happens when you sign the private contract and you get the reservation fee plus the money in advance for the pri for the fianza, and later you cannot complete the contract. And the second one, what if it's not you, but the vendor that at the very last minute pulls out of the deal, maybe even in front of the notary, uh, once they receive the first amount of money? Uh, you need to unmute yourself, yes. there you go. Fantastic. Well, it's, it's a very common question uh, and it's very usual that this happens in, the, in, 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 in several cases. And if you, uh, if you pay the reservation fee uh, or the money in advance for the price with the, with, the doc, with the private document and you cannot complete the contract, then the law is very clear. You will lose your mind. And uh, it's very, well, it, almost 100% of the cases in the contract, uh, a, a, well, the, the lawyers will put in a stipulation telling exactly this point. You will lose your money if you, don't, if you cannot complete, complete the, uh, the, well, the, 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 the purchase. Where, wherever, whenever the case, uh, it, depend, it doesn't depend on, of, of the market, you know? And if it's the vendor who doesn't want to sign in front of the notary, then he will have to give you the double, the, to, give, to give you back the double of the amount you gave, you gave him in advance uh, for the price. It's very clear. Or you will lose your money or you, or you will get the double of the, of the, of the, of the amount you, you gave before. Excellent. Thank you very much. That, that really helps. And uh, we're going to have only two more questions because we want to, to finish right on time. And then maybe if you want to, uh, our participants, if you want to do any uh, questions, raise your hand. I know that Jonathan has a, a comment in there. So thank you very much for raising your hand in there. It's so engrossed with what uh, Antonio was saying. Oh. I think you muted yourself. <laughs> there you go. Sorry. I was so engrossed with what Antonio was saying, I almost forgotten what I was going to say. But I was just going to say, you might have seen me clapping. I wasn't actually clapping the other participants. But actually, uh, one of the downsides of living in the country, as we do, is uh, the various uh, creatures that, uh, that live in the country with you. And uh, at the moment, we're under siege from some very horrible um, little flies that bite, really bad bites. And my wife's got some really bad bites on her from these little flies. And we can't figure out where they're coming in, but, but because I've got the light in front of me, they're coming to the light. So I'm, I'm, I'm killing flies. So that's... Fair that's enough, fair enough. So you're not dancing flamenco or something? <laughs> no, not okay. Good to know, good to know. We all feel a lot better now that we do, we do know. So just a couple of questions in there. Uh, we've got one that has to do, I think it's, it's going to be with uh, real estate. So is it necessary to, uh, or, or advisable to do a technical inspection of the property before buying? Uh, so where do you stand on, on that question, Karina? Yes. Uh, yes and no, actually. If you buy an apartment that has uh, stood there for a while and you yourself can see that there are no cracks, no damp, no, not, not anything that uh, awakens your suspicion, then you wouldn't really need to, to um, make a survey, a technical inspection about an, uh, for an apartment. But if you're buying a villa or a town house or a farmhouse, a countryside house, especially houses that are, that are built on the side of, of a hill. You should definitely make a survey and uh, the people um, you should um, hire then could be an architect, a builder that has uh, an architect degree. Uh, a technician with an architect degree or building en engineer, uh, th these kind of, uh, of uh, professionals. And you should also check that they have an insurance in case they do a bad job, you can sue them actually. <laughs> and um, so, so for, for that kind of properties, it would be very important. So, uh, 
the things that should be checked then it's of course of course uh, first of all structural uh, issues if there's any sev severe cracks and all the installations like water electricity pool uh, pool machinery all these kinds of things is important to check and going back to a, an apartment, you can do a um, smaller visual check yourself. Try to put on the water or flush the toilet, or you see if you get the knob, the faucet in your hand, or <laughs> things like that. Fantastic. So, on Thank that topic, I just, I just wanted to add, just before this webinar, I was in another webinar with a survey agent. So he's a British guy who lived here for 30 years doing nothing else about this. So if you have any questions about that, we have connections that we can help you find these people. Fantastic. Thank you very much. And may I, last... may, sorry, may I also inform you about another important or interesting detail that not many people know about, I think. We have something in Spain called ITE. It's Inspection Tecnico de Edificios. And that is also uh, actually by law, if the if the house, the building, apartment building or or any property is is old, fifty years, it's by law necessary to make uh, uh, an ITE. It's like you go to the the yearly check of, of your car, so it has to be done by uh, for for properties as well. Uh, so for properties that are from the 70s when they are about to reach 45 years of age it's necessary to to do this inspection in an urbanization it's the community that uh, takes a decision about to to do it to execute it fantastic great information as well and our last question over here has to do with beckham so if you like football uh, that's what it is. How does Beckham Law apply when you move to Spain? And in which cases does that apply? So obviously that's for Rothier, I think. Yeah. Okay. Now I am mute. Okay. Uh, well, it's a very old law because how many years David Beckham went down from uh, Real Madrid football club? I mean, I'm not a... Uh, uh, well, but the question is, that expression has its origin in, a, in David Beckham, who well, he was a well-known English footballer who played for Real Madrid Football Club. The Beckham Law, or Special Expat Tax Regime, from Spanish Régimen Especial para Trabajadores Desplazados, exists for those who moved to Spain to work and become tax residents in Spain by staying more than 183 days during the calendar year. This tax regime gives them to this person, to these people, sorry, the option of paying tax as non-residents despite being tax residents. This means that their income from employment is taxed at a fixed rate of 24% up to 600,000 euros of income and 45% uh, thereafter. Uh, it is not easy to say what cases it is interesting to apply for. However, to give a general idea, it is generally better to choose the special expat tax regime only if you receive gross income higher than 50,000 euros per year. I don't know if that is okay. That, that helps, I think, uh, <laughs> for all those football players uh, in the room. And if we are if we are applying that. No good asking me about football. It's a long shape ball for me. Of course. <laughs> Excellent. So before we wrap up, I would love to ask from any of the participants in the webinar, any of the visitors, if you have any questions, if you want to raise your hand, or if there's anything that you would like to double check, uh, or, or any, any other comments that you can give us, please feel free to do that. But also, if you do have an interest in receiving the recording of this webinar alongside with the Q&A, that we've done at the end, we'll be more than happy to shift it your way so um, you can either help someone that has those questions. And also, if, if it's okay with you and you want to be in contact with the speakers, uh, and if you're okay with it, we would love to uh, allow you to be in contact with them by sharing with you their contact details and, and make use of their expertise as much as you, as you need to. So that's the, the end of our webinar. Thank you very much for attending. 
And uh, yeah, check also our website, btbclub.biz. And if you feel like it, you can visit one of our online meetings when you can meet again any of the experts that have helped us on this webinar. So thank you very much and have a very good evening.